This is our backyard. This is the Gold Family Dairy Farm. This is my backyard. This is my business's backyard, my associate's backyard, and my backyard. This is our backyard. I'm at the Macon Nature Preserve and this is my backyard. This is my backyard. Every community in Wisconsin that is connected to Lake Michigan has treasured landscapes and natural features essential to our ecological, cultural, and economic health. These are places so important to living here that, should they cease to exist, life in the region would be fundamentally changed for our children. Fortunately, there is a network of citizens hard at work protecting the places that make this basin home. From Door County to the Illinois border, citizen-run land trusts and conservancies are creating parks and trails, setting aside land to safeguard water quality and preserving working farmland and forests as the region grows. In this great basin, we share a common love for the treasure that is Lake Michigan. The good fortune of living in the Great Lakes watershed comes with the increasingly complicated challenge of taking care of it. All the people in our communities, business leaders, farmers, policymakers, recreators, and landowners are invested in the vitality of our land and waters. As the demands on our natural resources expand, our land trusts are among our best community resources for protecting the places we all need and cherish. And we're lucky to have them because this is our backyard. introduce myself first and then I'm going to uh, get our day going here and, and get us on to what we are, we're here to do. Uh, my name is Mike Striegel. I'm executive director of an uh, organization called Gathering Waters Conservancy. We're a statewide organization that works to support uh, Wisconsin's 50 plus land trusts and what we do is try to make those community-based organizations, those organizations that are working locally to protect the places that make their communities special, we exist to make them stronger across the state. Uh, one of the ways we do that one of the ways we try to make those groups stronger is through a, a collaboration that we call the Lake Michigan Shorelands Alliance. The Lake Michigan Shorelands Alliance is the 10 land trusts that exist here in the Lake Michigan Basin, including the Glacial Lakes Conservancy here in, in Sheboygan, that are working to protect the places that make this basin special. And as you saw on, on the video there, and as you all know, there are plenty of places that make this, this place special. And they recognize it across the world. Uh, the passage of the, the Great Lakes Compact uh, just recently reminds us of that. So this Lake Michigan Shorelands Alliance has come together to set priorities and to work together to find ways to protect the places that make this basin special and important on into the future. And what we're hoping to do today, at the goal of today's uh, Great Lake Gathering, it, which is sponsored by Gathering Waters Conservancy and the Lake Michigan Shorelands Alliance, is we're trying to bring together the people who can help these land trusts and are interested in working with these land trusts to achieve those goals, to the, those priorities that have been set. And again, continue that conversation of, of what is important and how do we best protect these things that are special. So th thank you for being a part of that. Um, we'll be going through the day today. Uh, we'll have some speakers who can set the tone and, and give us some context for how this fits into it fits in nationally and globally, why it's important economically, ecologically, and socially that we work on these things. And I think exciting, uh, one exciting part is we'll have a panel of people who are doing things here locally, some of the special things that are happening here that, that you 
can get involved in. And then we want you to walk away with, and you already have the folders in front of you, ways that you can connect uh, personally, and hopefully that you will be interested in, in connecting with these efforts personally. Before I launch us into the program, though, I have uh, some thank yous and some introductions to do. Um, I want to recognize some of the special people we've, we've had join us here today, some of the people that we've tried to engage in this conversation uh, that can help us achieve some of these goals. And, and they're all of you, certainly, but we, we have especially worked hard to have our elected officials represented today. And we have some of them with us today. And if they could just wave their hands and say hello. Uh, Jim Baumgard, who helped us on our advisory council on the Sheboygan County Board with us here today. Um, Suzanne Brault. Pago from Senator Feingold's office is here with us today. Marlene Milkey from Senator Cole's office is with us today as well. State Senator uh, Joe Liebham was with us today. And Adam Payne, uh, the county administrator here in Sheboygan. Thank you for being here, Adam. And thank you all of, all of you again. All of you are important to this conversation, but we're very grateful to have our elected officials who do so many things to make the, the work that we do uh, possible. I also want to thank uh, another group that has made this work possible, and they're in your program. It's our, our sponsors for today. And if you could just take a look on the inside cover there. But I do want to recognize them especially. The Argosy Foundation the Brico Fund, the Joyce Foundation, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program, and the Sheboygan River Basin Partnership. Uh, all these were essential to uh, making this happen. And I should have said at the beginning, but let me say now that we're doing four Great Lake gatherings. I see some faces who've been at our first one, which was in Green Bay. This is the second. Uh, next Wednesday, so October 8th, we'll be in Mequon. And then on October 15th, we'll be in Milwaukee. So four of these gatherings uh, to bring together people from across the basin to talk about priorities and talk about ways to get involved. So thank you for being a part of that conversation. And I hope you'll, you'll continue with this. Uh, you'll see ways to get in touch in your folder, but also obviously on the web at greatlakegatherings.org. So uh, stay with this. I mean, this is a conversation that has been going on a long time before this, and will have to go on a long time after this. And, and you've been connected. Hopefully you can get more connected today. Um, but you know, now let us uh, get started with our day's events. I have the honor right now of introducing our keynote speaker. Uh, and before I give you uh, some of his credentials, I want to tell just a brief story. He's from Green Bay, and we'd heard about him and his work. And um, as I said, one of the goals of these Great Lake gatherings and the work that we've been doing for more than a year to plan these and, and get these started was to connect people who cared about their communities, cared about uh, the Great Lakes, cared about the communities in the Great Lakes Basin in Wisconsin, to connect them to the land trust, connect them to the people who are actively working to protect the things that make these places special. And we'd heard a little bit about him, and he seemed like a natural fit for what we wanted to do. So I, I drove up to Green Bay to visit with him. And it was one of the happiest moments of, of my work on, on this effort um, as I talked about what we were doing. And, and his eyes absolutely lit up, and he just about burst out of his seat to say, why didn't I know more about this? Why, why didn't I know more about what land trusts were doing? And I said, well, you, you do now. And now, now you have a way to get connected. And I knew at that moment that we'd, we'd made that connection in a way, and we've all experienced it in our life. But to, that tipping point for me to say, hey, this is exactly why we're doing this, and this, this shows me why this can work. So I hope Paul doesn't mind, but you've been kind of my poster child as I've talked about the goals of, the, of this work. And hopefully as he talks to you this morning, you can kind of see where, where he's coming from and why that, why that is so important to us as we try to make this, this work go forward. Uh, but let me get, and forgive me for reading a little bit, but I want to get it right and give you a little bit of uh, a sense of where Paul comes from. Paul Linsmeyer is the co-founder and general partner of Innovation for Sustainable Operations Incorporated based in Green Bay, Wisconsin. He has extensive experience in sustainable business and understands the trends, growth, and guidance needed for businesses to adopt green business practices. So again, one of the things that attracted us is here's somebody who has, has grown up and come through uh, the business community, but like so many of our business leaders and economic development, uh, people interested in economic development, they see the need uh, for organizations like land trusts. Uh, that, that's all part of uh, making a community grow and the economic development of a community. Recently, Paul was appointed by the U.S. Department of Commerce to represent the United States at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development policy meetings in Paris. 
He was chosen because of his expertise in triple bottom line, that's economic, social, and ecologic uh, strategies, and his role in developing regional economies. He also serves as the sustainability chair of New North, the economic development for this, this region, economic development authority for this region, and the industry chair of the Wisconsin Global Warming Task Force and the Bay Area Workforce Development Network. Please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Linsmeyer. Thank you. Yeah, I was really taken aback when I first heard about the um, the land um, trust because, you know, as one of the founders of the, of the New North, uh, and those of you who who know the New North uh, know it's about really creating a, a shared vision, um, f you know, for a sustainable future. Um, that that one of my purposes was to bring together all the, the various people that were, would be part of, of helping develop and create a sustainable future for our 18 county initiative. And land trust is such an important piece because I lived in New York City, um, San Francisco, Chicago, and Denver um, in, in the last 40 years and, and running businesses there. And um, I was drawn back to Wisconsin twice, once in 1977 from San Francisco, and um, by the way, I had an opportunity to buy a house for 75,000, four bedroom house for the pool. I thought they were crazy. I came back to Wisconsin and bought a house for 18,000. Um, <laughs> that house that I bought for 18,000 might be worth about 50 or 60. <laughs> Other house is probably worth about two million. But anyway, <laughs> and I moved back from the mountains outside of Denver. And, uh, and one of the things I moved back for were, were memories. And, and, and possibilities. Um, I've always been really impressed with the political history of, of Wisconsin. I think we've been always a pro progressive state, sometimes too humble, but we always were thinking ahead. And, and as, I, as I look at some of the ideas that are still going on in, in, in the new north, in the state of Wisconsin, we have a lot of progressive, very entrepreneurial ideas. We have a very strong um, manufacturing base. Uh, we just re really need to rethink how we do things. Um, so I came back here because I remember one time when I was a child, I drove my bicycle with my brothers and, and my buddies out to Barrett's Creek. And I can't remember how far Barrett's Creek was from where I lived. I lived near St. Vincent. Hospital, but it seemed a long way on that old Schwinn that I painted red flames on, and uh, and, and we, we we would spend the day out there just wandering around, climbing hills and trees and doing all that kind of stuff, and those are cool memories. And I wanted my my children were starting to get grown, but I wanted them to experience some of that, and I wanted my grandchildren to experience some some of those things, and even I wanted them to experience the fact that I brought home two little baby raccoons, and I forgot to tell my mom that they were down in the basement, and one got up. And got in the refrigerator when she opened it up it jumped out and that was the end of the raccoons I had to bring it back <laughs> so you know and I think we all have memories ab about you know the, the, the night we, s we spent you know uh, camping and, 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 and laying out looking up at the stars but also, we, we have memories of other things ab about, you know, about what, what land trust can develop. But let me talk about, a little bit about the concept of sustainability and why land trusts by themselves are not a silver bullet. Just as business by itself is not a silver bullet, community is not a silver bullet, They're, they all have to, have to have an integration. Sustainability is systems thinking on steroids. That's really what it means. It's, it's understanding the interrelationship of all the systems that we deal with. Now, I, I was also an altar boy for the side altar masses at St. Wilbrod's Parish in Green Bay, Wisconsin for Vince Lombardi. He had a separate um, service every day. And so I, I feel I can say this. When Vince Lombardi said something to the effect that winning isn't every, everything, it's the only thing, well, if you take that out of context, that's really wrong. And, and, and let me tell you why. Um, companies can win but employees and communities can lose. Just take New Page, for example. You know, you know, you know. We, we have to look at, at as organizations. What are we doing, uh, not just to, for the betterment of a company, but what are we doing for the betterment of society in general? And and what are we doing for the be betterment of environment? Let's take a look at a little bit at this this mess we're in with the financial situation. And I, I don't prove to be an expert at all, but look at all the winners for so long. People who bought homes who really shouldn't have been able to afford it. One, 
short term. People who got incentives to, 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 to give mortgages to people who couldn't afford it won. Banks won. People were winning constantly, but because they were winning in, in, in a vacuum, and, and the, the system basically imploded. So, so we, we have to remember that we are a system. We as a community are a system, and we have to understand. And that's why when I talk about sustainability, I'm talking about the interrelationship of people, planet, and profits. The interrelationship of the economy that we have, the, the environment that we, that we want to protect and, and enhance, and, and the whole issue about people. Um, Let's just take example of one, one more example just so we, we can really hone this home because we are all responsible for where we are. You know, how many people are shareholders in a company and want to get a, a, a very healthy return for, for, for their investment? We all would. But if by doing that we're making the leaders of those companies get more and more myopic and look more and more quarter to quarter instead of looking at, at, at not just the prosperity of the company but also the prosperity of the communities in which they serve and their customer base and, and, and the whole nine yards, then we're really doing them a, a, a disservice. So we have to understand that in, as individuals we have many things that we can point to ourselves as being part of the problem. And that's why looking at land trusts is so exciting. I think it's really part of the solution. Um, I think one of the things that is really exciting about gathering waters and the people that are around it and a lot of the people in this room that I got a chance to, to meet earlier is that you are the ones that are filling a void of leadership in this country today. You are going out and saying I can do something, I can make a change and, and I can do it by getting involved in, in, in boards, by running for office and actually helping create a sustainability committee that maybe wouldn't happen if, if your le leadership wasn't there, Mayor. And, 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 and making those things happen. We have such a dearth of leadership in this, in this country around issues of sustainability. And I think that is really troubling. I am on an international committee. I just got back from New York last week representing the United States. I was in Paris in April uh, to, to show the, the international community, that there is business leadership coming to the table who understands the principles of the triple bottom line and really wants to make those things happen. And again, that's why I think it's so exciting to hear about land trusts because land trusts are, are part of, of a picture of a community and a state, a, a community, a region, and a state. Think about this. Why do companies come to a community? and Why do companies stay in a community? They don't stay because they get tax cuts and financial incentives and the like. They, that may be part of it. But they really stay because the talent is there. The people with the skills are there. And what keeps people with talent in communities, in regions, and in states? It's because it has the, the type of diversity of, of entertainment, of art, of, of, um, of community spirit, of community culture. That's what makes pe people want to be there. So, you know, I, I think we got to really start looking as, as we're trying to develop our economic plans as a subsector, the city of, 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 of Sheboygan, or as, as a bigger subsector, if we call this whole freshwater coast, um, you know, having, you know, having some sort of brand or metric, or if we start talking about a collaboration with the, all the Great Lakes states and how do we create that as a, as a brand of a place that we want to be, that is what we really need to have to become effective. And that's the message I'm sending to the international community is that we have companies and we have communities in this country who understand the value of, of putting people, planet, and profits first. And understand that you can't, you can't optimize any one of those three triple bottom line theories without sub-optimizing the other ones. You have to have it at an equal level. And so, and so you need to have programs to make that happen. So um, I, th I think, you know, as, as, we, as we look at, um, at, at, at some of the things that, that, uh, that really draw talent here, it's, it's, um, 
things such as um, roads, buildings, public service, uh, public transportation, healthcare, education. But it's also things like, what is, what is our view of, of public art? And how, how does art and, and architecture make a statement for our community. Now I know that the city of Sheboygan has done just a remarkable job with this shorefront. I think this this art museum in which we, we stand today is just such a fine example of, of, of positive things that we can do as a community. In Green Bay I was at a meeting yesterday where we were looking at, at you know, how can we get art integrated in with all the other fine things that we have as a city and help overcome some of the challenges that we have. So while land trusts are, are really important as, 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 as a piece of, of getting, um, um, as a real a positive for, for ourselves, it has to be in with a, a whole complete strategy around um, triple bottom line thinking. So, um, let's just talk a little bit about the triple bottom line so you, so you really understand what I mean and why it's so important to understand it. The, the people piece refers to social equity. It refers to you know, having a sense of fair play. It refers to having a, a, a sense of wellness, a sense of safety, a sense of, of, um, of um, health for, for everybody involved in the community or in, in companies. Um, it refers to something that I call lifelong learning, a cradle to grave learning. I think it's we're in a very serious situation in, in this in this state right now. I used to be the chair, uh, Senator Lieben and I were on the uh, Council on Workforce Investment together, and I was the chair of that organization. And I think some of the challenges we, we, we see in this state around around people who don't have skills. You know, people my age who don't have skills to do the jobs that they're at, and companies, and organizations, you know, and, and even even the, the 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 federal system of training isn't necessarily robust enough to be able to get us what we need to have, and and even even the interesting thing I was at uh, I was at uh, breakfast today with a young woman who was talking about the fact that we have we have um, uh, so people wanting solar um, installed on their homes, but they can't get any solar installed because there's no installers in the Milwaukee area. Well, that, that's a real big disconnect with, with getting things done. Um, and I think that's a real problem. Um, a, a, a second piece is the whole piece of, uh, uh, under people is a whole piece about creative energy. If we would think about the biggest challenge for this state and this country as we compete in a global economy is around creativity and innovation. Creativity and innovation are what make us different. If we look at the hundred some thousand engineers that are graduating in India and China every year, and what do we look at the difference between those engineers and ourselves? Those en engineers didn't have the traditional liberal arts um, education that we had. So that gives us our innovation and that gives us our can-do spirit. But what are we doing? We're starting to cut that out of our programs. That's a, that's a serious problem and I think we really gotta, we really got to look at that. Um, because innovation and creativity are, are the difference. Um, Let's look a little bit at the happiness factor, and I think this is where land trusts fit in immensely. The American population in the last 30 years has been uh, markedly seen a market decrease in, in happiness. While they've improved uh, in, in income, not so much in the last few years, but in income and in, in uh, getting stuff. But they're, unha they're basically unhappy. You know, I think one of the things that land trusts can help us do is can help us refocus on what's important in, in life. And what's important is having a, 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 a sort of a almost spiritual uh, relationship with the land. And, and I think we really need to get back to that. Hap happiness factor means that we've really got to start uh, parking our cars outside of our attached garages and tearing down our fences and putting up front porches so we can start talking to people. Happiness means that we cannot ha only have relationships at work, which is, which is, uh, the study show is very true because people are so busy running their kids and doing other things, they don't have solid relationships except at, except at work. You know, so we, we really need to, 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 to start tearing down the barriers. 
And then I think the last issue under the people thing that really needs to be addressed is the intergenerational crisis that we have right now. And I think people really don't understand it at all. You know, people are concerned about baby boomers. Many of us are close to or at retirement age and the crisis that these people are going to go outside the market and, and we won't have people to replace them. And I suggest that may not be true because many of us, I'm, I'm not that far from retirement age and I'm not, I don't plan to retire. <laughs> so I, 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 I have retired from traditional work. I'm now doing what I want to do, what I want to do my whole life. And, and uh, so how can we take other people like myself and maybe introduce them into the, into the workforce in different ways? To do that, we need educational institutions and, and, and companies working together to get these people re-engaged in non-traditional roles within companies. That's sustainability. That's, that, that's a people part of sustainability. But the real crisis is in the fact that the older generation thinks the young, younger generation doesn't have a work ethic. And I think that's absolute nonsense. They just don't have our work ethic. And maybe we ought to reassess ours. You know, when, when, when many of us put the priorities for work ahead of, of family and, and ahead of, of, of enjoyment and ahead of happiness, I think that, that creates a real problem. And so for us to have a, a, a judgment against this other generation, if we don't think we have this in companies, I've been all over the country and all over the world talking to companies and going inside the bowels of companies. Is it, this is loud and clear. And, and it's, you know, the intergenerational issue is huge and it's being ignored. So I think we, we really need to, to get to the bottom of that. As far as the second piece of the triple bottom line, the planet, we obviously need clean air and water. And, and I, I think... Um, you know, as chair of the industry council of the, of the of the Wisconsin Global Warming Initiative, I really got an education on on first of all, what are the problems, what are the issues, but what are the barriers to collaboration? And I think part of the part of the problem is is many of us are successful in our, our in our own right. We do things really well, but we have no idea of, of what we do how it affects the system, how it affects other parts of the system, how it affects, you know, how do, how do I as a business person affect, um, you know, uh, society? You know, well, I give donations, you know, to, to charity. Well, you know, no, that's not good enough. That's, that's not what it's about. It's about how do I as a business get involved in the community, either by helping get some of my employees on boards or, or on committees, or actually working, targeting a specific charity that I mean, really going all out to try to fix a problem, like the fact that we have a, a, a tremendous achievement gap for, 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 for uh, children who, who, who don't have uh, support systems from birth to five years old. That's a serious problem. Many of those people are going to be, many of those children are going to um, become uh, uh, problems for the state in the future. So as, 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 as organizations and people, we have to reach out and do more. We have to understand how all the systems connect. And that's one of the reasons that the New North itself is a picture of sustainability, because we have every single stakeholder, except land trusts, and now we got them, <laughs> at the table talking about problems together, bringing their various lenses and, and fixing things. So that's, that's a really important point. We need to, we need to have places to, to recreate and, re, and relax. And I think that's one thing that, that land trust can help us with. Because I think one of the things that's really lacking is people reconnecting with nature. My company, we, we, we wrote, um, uh, we wrote a, um, our employee handbook um, that is probably really unusual. Because it, it doesn't have a lot of prescriptive things. Uh, but it does have one thing, that four days a year, we're going to spend a day in, in very intimate uh, community with nature, that we really under, that we were going to do something really special so that we never forget our true relationship with nature. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, I already talked about the, uh, on the whole planet thing that in, in the environment piece is, is you have to be con concerned
concerned not only about the health of the water and air and, and all that, but you have to be concerned about the actual environment. You know, looking at Richard, Richard Florida's creativity index, which Wisconsin scored relatively low, especially the Green Bay area. Um, you know, and, but since then, I think we've done a lot of good things. How do we actually look at what makes people want to be part of our community? And how do we look at things that makes people really want to be, that our community really appears to be vibrant? Because it not only appears to be, because it is. And I think that th those are things that are really important. Under the profits things, I think we, we really have uh, to look at, at strong economies, which are, I, as I talked about earlier, are built uh, on uh, talented people. We have to look at diversity. We have to look at immigration. We have to have real talks about those things. We can't leave it to politicians. We have to talk about it. We have to understand it. And then we we um, we need to start talking about things like, as as business leaders and as community leaders, about living within our means, about overconsumption. We really need to have real a dialogue on those things, or, or I, I think we're just going to continue on this downward spiral. Um, and then the last thing is we really need to have 21st century accounting principles. We are using 19th and early 20th century accounting principles to, to drive us in a, an economy which is driven on 21st century global principles. And when I talk about that, what I, what I mean is we need to look at leading indicators rather than lagging indicators. And I talk to my companies about that all the time. Because if you're looking at leading indicators, some of the stuff that's happening today is not going to come as a surprise. For example, they've been talking about there have been reporters talking about this, um, the, 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 the home uh, bubble for at least six years. So if somebody said this, this came up on us, you've not been, not been watching. So, you know, I, I, I own a lot of property and I, and I made some real wise decisions now that I look back at it a couple of years ago. And, 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 I, and I, I basically divested and, and got into some other things. Well, our, as companies and as communities and as organizations, not-for-profits, are we really looking at leading indicators that could really have a substantial effect on us? Look at the whole NGO field, not-for-profits. It's going to be tough to get money now. I mean, you know, it's just going to be a challenge. It's been a challenge for a long time, but it's going to be a bigger challenge. How are you going to survive? Have you thought about, you know, a contingency plan? That's sustainability. That's, that's what that's about. Um, it also means that when you're looking at capital projects, and I, I'm working with uh, a, a lot of institutions that are doing major, major, you know, 200, 300 million dollar projects, and, um, and you know, besides looking at the, their, their capital costs, you know, one of the things they're trying to do as they propose these to their boards and their, and their funding institutions is, is how can they get, you know, get the return on investment to satisfy their boards and their investors? Well, if you start looking at projects in a different way, if you look at the, the capital costs of the project, but then you look at the operating costs of the system by, by, by going to a lead, a lead or a green style system, if you combine those two together, you're obviously going to have a, better, uh, a much better story to tell. And it really is all about the story you tell, it, it, whether you can convince somebody to, to engage in that pro project or not. But the problem is, is, is in the traditional accounting mechanisms, they want to use today's, today's dollars, everything in today's dollars. Well, we know tomorrow, tomorrow's dollars aren't going to be the same as today's dollars. Just look at trends. And so we need to have accounting principles that look at these things differently. So, you know, I think um, we, 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 we need a, just a couple other things to think about as we're going forward in the new north and in Wisconsin as a whole when you start thinking about sustainability and again why I don't want to talk solely about land trusts as being the panacea. We need to consider things like alternative transportation. You know, and, and this is really important. To, this is where, you know, you can never look at people, planet, and profit separately. You have to look at them together because what affects our people driving to and from work, the cost of fuel, not only affects their pocketbooks, it affects the money that they're going to spend on other things, but it affects the fact that you can't give them a pay raise that is going to equal the amount that they're going to have an increased cost to drive to and from work. So what are alternatives so we can start taking the, the burden off these 
individuals. And, and that means we have to have better mass transportation. We need to start thinking about high speed rail. You know, it, it's been proposed, you know, um, nationally, that it would really make a lot of sense as a transportation uh, uh, solution for the United States that you really don't need an Amtrak running across the country. What you really need is high speed regional rail running from, let's say, Green Bay to Chicago or Milwaukee. And, and then you need, um, you, you need a really good uh, airline carrier service from, from the major hubs so that you, the, the high speed rail will really get you a, a lot of real positive things. So that's, that again is sustainability uh, in action. Um, and again, I'm not proposing any one of these solutions outside of the context of all the other solutions. So we have to look at this as, as a, a big picture. Let's just look at one final thing, and this is the Great Lakes as, as a region. The Great Lakes as a region has all the power in the world. We can be the, the, the third largest economic engine in the country. But we can only do it if we collaborate. But one of the challenges, I, I'm bringing in a speaker for the New North called Richard Longworth, and he wrote a book called Caught in the Middle. And he, what he says in that book, and I agree with him 100%, is our biggest problem is we have not recognized the value in collaboration. We have not recognized the value. In the New North, we've started crossing county lines. We start crossing municipal lines. But we haven't recognized the value in, in, in the true value in collaboration yet. So we haven't even thought about reaching out to other states. In, 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 this, in this Great Lakes region and really look at, at the opportunities we have. Think about this, a possibility. If we would, if we would take, these states are all um, high manufacturing states, why don't we leverage that manufacturing expertise and combine it with our excellent, we have some of the best educational institutions in the world in, the, in these Great Lakes states. Why don't we start collaborating and start incubating new business and new ideas around water technology, around, around um, green technology, and start creating jobs in, 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 um, in business, incubating these ideas by, by, through collaboration. We just aren't there. That's not, that's not our thought process. And I think that is really where we need to go. If we start reaching across to other states, and this is a political thing, but it's, it's, it's also us. We're part of the political process. If we can actually help our legislators and our governor understand the value of, of collaboration, we can make this stuff happen. But we can't if we just sit back and wait. You know, we had a, we had a man die who I was, I, 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 I like him as an actor. Um, I thought he was pretty amusing and, and, uh, and did a pretty good job. But I think he was probably one of the finest men I knew. And I first met him, I didn't meet him personally, you know, a lot of these people you meet in movies, I met him in, uh, when I was a freshman at Marquette in 1969. And you know, they would have free movie day or whatever, and he and, he and, uh, and uh, Joanne Woodward were in this movie, and it was something about a race car or something, and he was gonna take his new, new, newly wedded wife to Milwaukee for honeymoon. And you know, I, that's the only part I can remember of the whole movie, but I thought it was so funny, like, why would you do that? <laughs> But this man really is, you know, I, I was very emotional when he died because he, he did what I would want to do. He did what I am doing. He, he gave a lot of money to things that he believed in. You know, he said something that, you know, so often it's not only about winning. It's not about the, the moral and ethical thing to do. I mean, God, does that say a lot? And he wasn't talking about any one particular administration. He was addressing the administrations in general. And he I went, actually went into a lot of detail. But th this man really created a sense of, hey, you can make a difference. You know, he, he was a pretty big name, so he made it in a big way. But we can all make a difference in, in, in our own way. And I think a lot of you are already doing that, but how do we get others to do that? That's, that's our challenge. So my, my main message to you, and I'll take some questions if there's some time, uh, is you know, let's look at land trust as a way, but not the only way, to really drive sustainability in our communities and our organizations. It's really gonna be, though, through a successful equal 
collaboration, according to Peter Drucker, a business, government, and NGOs that is going to drive system change. And I think that that is happening. It's started, but we have a long way to go. And I think the best thing that we can do, since we do have a dearth of leadership in this country around issues like this, is we can do it at a, at a local and a regional level and possibly even at a state level if we can get you know, through some of the political wranglings we have there and really start driving the change here until we can get the, the, the leadership in our country that's going to see that we again need to have that can-do spirit that we can be the change the world needs. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Gumto. I'm a member of the Sheboygan River Basin Partnership. We're here on Willow Creek today. This is one of our projects we've been working on for a number of years. And uh, we're right outside the city of Sheboygan. And the Willow Creek is important, and it's a, it's a really unique resource in that we have a, a um, cold water resource, a cold water trout stream, right next to an uh, urbanized setting in an area that's uh, proposed to be have future, more urbanization. Um, in an area that, that will have future urbanization. And through our work back in the early 2000s, there was some documentation of cold water fish species, coho, salmon, brook trout, brown trout in this creek. And that wasn't known before. Since we've gotten involved, we've done some more surveys and found out that we've got not only coho and chinook salmon, which are Great Lake fish species, We've also got brook trout and uh, brown trout, which are native to these types of smaller streams. In addition, we've got steelhead trout that are also another Lake Michigan fish. Now these big, these big lake fish come up into these small streams in the spring and in the fall to spawn. So these resources are really, spe are really unique to them and really vital to, uh, to reproduction, the reproduction cycle of, of the Great Lakes fishery. We've done surveys up here and we found the fry, which are the small, uh, so small new yearlings from uh, last year. And we found the, they're about three, four inches long, the coho and the chinook and the salmon. We're doing the surveys, the Sheboygan River Basin Partnership is doing these aquatic surveys using grant money from the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. They've also, these agencies have also provided us some technical assistance, uh, people and equipment to help us do these surveys. So through these surveys, we've been finding these small fish and the larger fish, and the uniqueness of this resource is this is the only place in Wisconsin that has been documented that steelhead, coho, and chinook salmon are naturally reproducing. These are put-and-take fish species that are mostly for tourism and for um, and for Great Lakes sports fishery. To have them naturally producing in these types of habitats is really unique and rare in Wisconsin. This is the only place outside Sheboygan, Wisconsin where this is actually happening. The reason the fish find this area attractive and find it um, suitable for their reproduction is one is, as you can see, it's a very, it's a very clean water, water body. It, there's very little sediment in this, in this tributary. The other thing, it's got the right uh, cobble, mix of cobble and sand in the substrate, which is the bottom of the creek. And the third important part is it's a cold water resource, which means it's getting its water supply from underground. So groundwater is, is discharging into the stream at these locations, and that cold water is what, is what the fish eggs need to, to survive. Why, why do so many other rivers not Sure. There are other streams like this up and down the lake shore on the west shore of Lake Michigan. They're, they may have good water quality, they may lack the groundwater discharge or the cold water influence. 
this this particular stream has all those components that, that makes uh, it's, it makes the, the reproduction successful. So you need the mix of the cold water, the right kind of substrate, and um, and in this case, you can also see the shading effect, which helps keep the cold water cool. Um, you can hear in the background, we're, we're not, I said, I said before, we're right next to the city of, city of Sheboygan. We're also right next to I-43. So you can hear the traffic in the background. And so that, in my mind, that makes this really unique. You know, you've got urbanization, you've got a major highway corridor, and thousands of people travel up and down this corridor every day, drive right over this creek and do not know what's going on. So as part of our organization, what we're trying to do is get public awareness, make the public aware of what this resource is, and, and get the public to understand, and get the public enthused about protecting this resource. That's our next challenge. We've done a lot of study on this creek, a lot of study's been done. We can do more study, but at this point, we're at the, we need to do some protection. And protection comes in the form of working with municipalities, working with the adjacent landowners, to do things such as establishing buffers where um, maybe you have a 50 or 100 foot buffer along this creek where there can be no development. Or uh, uh, providing more shade cover, providing planting some trees next to the river to provide some shade cover, which again will help cool this, the river down. But, so that, but who's going to do this work? The work's going to get done in a lot of different ways. It's, going to, it's not going to happen by a state agency alone. It's not going to happen by a local unit of government. It's going to happen through uh, cooperation of all those entities. And the money's not going to only come from one place either because this watershed is, the Willow Creek watershed is separated by five different municipalities. We've got Village of Kohler, Town of Sheboygan, Town of Sheboygan Falls, City of Sheboygan, and Town of Sheboygan. And all these municipalities have their political boundaries through this creek. So we need all these groups to pull together and, and understand what the resource is, why it's important to protect, and what we can do to enhance it. Um, I really feel that a stream like this running through a, a piece of property or running through a municipality is something that can be enhanced and, and enjoyed by a number of people and not just considered a waterway to convey water. It, you know, we just walked and coming down to this spot, we just walked on a trail. A lot of people use this trail. My vision of this area would be there'd be a trail that connects along Willow Creek that connects the city of Sheboygan Falls to the city of Sheboygan. And people can look at this at this stream and enjoy it. Now I noticed some of the signage, this, this has been a, a little park trailway. Some of the signage needs to be worked on and redone. Yeah. We've got a number of different initiatives going on right now for this for this Willow Creek. We're, de we're working with the municipalities to develop a stormwater management plan. We've got recently did a brochure that we can hand out to the public so they can understand the history and the, the uniqueness of this resource. We've also entered into a recent project where we're, we've got signs we've developed, very durable signs that can weather the weather conditions and weather the elements that will help explain to people what's happening here along Willow Creek and it will be there for many years to come. Some of our partners on the sign program are University of Wisconsin Extension, uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Sheboygan County. We're, get, we're looking to get funds from Wisconsin Public Service Corporation. So we're, again, this is a multi-discipline effort trying to get a lot of partners together to fund the re to fund the, some of the initiatives we have, and to get the get the word out to the public. One of the goals of our project here along Willow Creek is to stabilize areas like this. Right here along this trail, we've got some bank erosion, and one of the projects we have coming up is to do some activities to stabilize this bank so it doesn't continue to wash. When it washes. Some of the fine soil material washes into the stream. Not a big, that's not a, a, a big deal in a small section like this. But when, you th when we go further upstream and downstream, there's some other areas where this bank erosion causes a lot of sedimentation to enter into the waterway. And that sediment can cover the, the fish eggs during critical uh, times of, of egg, egg incubation. Now, are some things going to be done to correct this? Or, or 
need the bank? Yeah, yeah, what we'll do is we'll come up with some very simple techniques to stabilize this bank. It may include putting a rock, a series of rocks along here um, to hold the so hold to keep the water away from the soil. We could put some fish structures here, some bank cover structures uh, to keep the keep the soil back and also allow some to keep to keep the soil back, but also to allow some some plant material to grow behind it. The bank erosion and the stabilization we're going to be doing along Willow Creek will happen wherever it's needed. As a river system, as a river moves down, there's different cutting and depositing that goes along along the banks. And this area just happens to be an area where there's some severe cutting along the bank. For the most part, though, this is pretty, pretty. Uh, there's pretty, pr very few areas like this. The history of Willow Creek. Willow Creek starts up in near Sheboygan Falls, near the intersection of Highway 23 and 32. In that segment of the of the of the channel, it's. If there's a lot of agriculture land use around the channel. The channel's been straightened, it's been dredged, and it's been culverted and rerouted. So one of the challenges we have at River at, along Willow Creek is to reverse some of those man-made influences that have happened over the years. Um, but as, as the creek moves to the east and flows closer to the city of Sheboygan, the geology changes. And when the geology changes, we start picking up some of these larger cobbles that are shown that show up in the river, and the river also starts to pick up a gradient. 